the narrow stretch of water separating Europe from Asia had become of the utmost importance in getting supplies to Russia. With Turkey on the side of Germany, if the channel was not taken, Russia's ability to support the Allies was threatened. The idea was to knock Turkey out of the war, to secure both land and sea communication with Russia. There was no way in which both of those actions, or either of them, could have broken the stranglehold that the Germans had on the Western Front. The war had to be won or lost on the West. Gallipoli was a mistake from the beginning to the end. On reaching the Turkish coast, Victor Kubit wrote to his mother, Sunday, August the 8th, 1915. Dear Mum, we are still in the harbour but expect to go forward sometime this week. But it may be a very long time before we see any fighting. The news we get here is exceedingly good and everybody is in the best of spirits. We are all very flourishing. Two days later, the battalion disembarked into small lighters and began to move towards the inhospitable shoreline of Suvla Bay. Today, there is still evidence of their landings. They were all safely ashore by nightfall and could hear the sound of distant gunfire. The whole of the Suvla campaign was hopelessly um, defect in any kind of command or administration. The landing was chaotic. They landed in the wrong places. Um, they spent 24 hours reorganizing themselves. In that 24 hours, they should have moved straight inland to occupy the Suvla plain and the hills behind. But that 24 hours gave the Turks to bring up their main reinforcements, and they were experienced infantrymen. The officers and men of the Sandringham Company together with the rest of the 5th Norfolks, were marched in single file to their frontline positions. But they soon discovered that they had other enemies, as well as the Turks. It was horrible, horrible. That's the only word you can describe it. They were in these trenches, the Turks were close to them, all their water had to be carried up, the hills, all their supplies, their ammunition, the flies were literally, you couldn't eat your food. The flies were crawling all over everything. And not only that, they had to put up then with dysentery which swept through all of our lines. On August the 12th, the battalion was ordered to clear the plain of Turkish troops. But their maps show the wrong area. Minutes before the attack, they were told to move half right. No other troops received that order. They were alone and dangerously exposed. The attack began at four o'clock. We know from contemporary accounts that Lieutenant Colonel Proctor Beecham walked in front of his men towards the enemy as if on a Sunday afternoon stroll. Captain Frank Beck was leading his men revolver in hand when a shell exploded nearby. He was never seen again. Second Lieutenant Randall Burroughs, just 19, was shot and killed in front of his men. Lance Corporal Alfred Tubby was shot in the chest and died instantly. Captain Randall Cubitt, searching for cover, was shot in the side and killed. Major Ernest Woodwork threw his hands above his head and fell backwards, shot by a sniper. Second Lieutenant Roland Pelly, his jaw shattered, muttered a prayer. Oh God, if I can be of any use, use me. But if not, bring on the darkness mighty quick. That was the last that was seen or heard of the Sandringhams. The remainder simply vanished. It took some time before wind of the disaster began to reach Norfolk. Eustace Cubitt wrote to his parents at Honing Hall, trying to break the news gently. We went into action last Wednesday and got it frightfully hot. A large number of officers are missing, including Randall and Victor. But as so many who all went into action together are missing, we all have strong hopes that they are prisoners. It absolutely shattered them, but I think they accepted it as some sort of a challenge. They've got to carry on. Uh, I think my arrival helped things quite a lot. Uh, I was born exactly eight weeks after this uh, action in, in Suvla Bay, and uh, I, I think uh, it was something to uh, think about. Captain Arthur Patrick 
was seen surrounded by Turkish soldiers being disarmed and taken prisoner of war. So his family had some hope. The first of the letters from the Red Cross were vaguely hopeful. As you know, he was reported missing. One of those tags which just leaves that vague element of hope for many of the people concerned. And uh, I think the next one probably a little bit more depressing, but I remember that there was a letter, the last one, I think, in December 1915, which said they regretted that they could find no trace of a Captain Arthur Patrick in any Turkish POW camp or in any Turkish hospital. All over the Sandringham estate, families waited anxiously for information about their loved ones, but there was no news. It was the whole local community that was affected by this sad day, because every man knew the other. There were gamekeepers, gardeners, estate workers, people who'd been brought up together and lived together, and it must have been a very closely knit community, and the effect was Nobody had ever had to contend with the sort of casualty figures that the Great War produced, um, thankfully, and um, thankfully not since. And the effects on communities were enormous, tremendous. Here we're talking about a small rural community with 150 people vanishing completely. Uh, the worry is over another two or three hundred because it would be days or weeks before the, even those that did survive were known to have survived. We, we really can't conceive of the, uh, the upset that it had and was to the people concerned. Newspapers began to carry photographs of the missing. The king, deeply concerned, cabled General Sir Ian Hamilton, commanding officer in Gallipoli. I am most anxious to be informed as to fate of men of the 5th Battalion, Norfolk Regiment, as they include the Sandringham Company and my agent, Captain Frank Beck. Hamilton said he could shed no light on the mysterious disappearances. Sir Dighton Probyn, controller of Queen Alexandra's household, and the Queen herself made unsuccessful inquiries through the American Embassy in Constantinople. Nevertheless, the newspapers were reporting the glorious and heroic deeds of the Norfolks and the King's pride in their achievements. These reports had little basis, in fact. The first inkling of their fate came in 1919, when the Reverend Pierpoint Edwards of the Graves Registration Unit discovered the bodies of the Norfolks near the site where they were last seen in Gallipoli. The newspapers now quoted from his official report, the Norfolks had died in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the Turks. The fate of the fifth Norfolks deserves to rank among the most glorious annals of our race. Cut off from help, they refused to surrender and died fighting. And there, the matter seemed to rest. In 1921, however, events took an unexpected turn when Captain Frank Beck's watch was discovered in Constantinople. Queen Alexandra had given uh, Sir Dighton Probyn a watch some years previously. And he asked the Queen whether he might give it to my grandfather on condition that my grandfather would take it with him to Gallipoli. In 1921, the General learned that a Turkish officer had the watch in his possession. And after much correspondence, uh, General Probyn recovered the watch early in 1922 and he gave it to my mother on the morning she married. I think it was uh, taken, yes, from the battlefield, there was no doubt about that. It's now become clear that it was not only looting that had taken place on that August day. The official report of the Reverend Pierpoint Edwards has finally come to light. There were instructions that his findings should not be published. There is no report of glorious death, only the horrors of war.
When the farmer returned to the ruins of his farm, it was covered with the decomposing bodies of British soldiers, which he threw down a small ravine. It was in this ravine that many of the bodies were found, and it would appear that they were surrounded in the farm and annihilated. The bodies were finally interred in the Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery at Asmak, a short distance from where they'd been found. But the story was to take a darker turn. Signaller Gordon Parker claimed that the Reverend Pierpoint Edwards had found every man shot in the head. Edwards' biographer cannot understand why this has been kept secret. I can only assume that it was classified information. If it was classified information, he would have respected this and just wouldn't have spoken about it to, to any of his friends. Gordon Parker obviously would have been associated with Gallipoli and, and knew of various happenings out in Gallipoli. The state that the bodies would have been found, that they in actual fact had all been shot in the head. It's now known that Pierpoint Edwards had close ties with the royal family. He attended many royal functions. He had a horse presented to him by Edward VII. King George V helped him on many occasions with his friendship for the royal family and his understanding of their worries. I think he would not have liked the royal family to have known how these lads had met their death. Nobody knows who suppressed the report or why. We can only guess it was done to protect the king. So why did the Turkish soldiers apparently massacre the surviving Norfolks? They were very reluctant to take prisoners. I don't think they knew they had to. It wasn't their idea of warfare. Um, it's the first experience they'd had of defending their own soil. They rose to the occasion and they proved themselves to be first-class infantrymen. Um, prisoners, no, they no idea they had to take any. Initially, they didn't take any. The Fifth Norfolk, to their credit, pressed on. They found themselves completely cut off. Uh, they had no support to the left, to the right, to the rear. They were very short of water and ammunition. They'd lost cohesion. They felt they'd no chance of survival whatsoever. The logical thing seemed to be to offer themselves a surrender, possibly as individuals, possibly as groups, but surrender they must have done because they were found in one group, believed to be shot in the head. A veteran, he said, you were Christians, we were Muslims, you had invaded our country, we had no great interest in taking prisoners. I believe they were captured. And bearing in mind we were invading Turkey, um, I imagine that in 1940 we wouldn't have been very happy about the Germans invading England, and I don't think we'd have taken too many prisoners. And I think the simple answer to the so-called vanished battalion is that they were taken, shot, and disposed of. But now we know what happened in this isolated Turkish field for there was a witness to the deaths of the Norfolks. At her home in Great Yarmouth, Mrs. Madge Webber keeps mementos of her brother-in-law, Arthur. Now, for the first time, she has told his remarkable story. Arthur Webber was a member of the Territorials with the 5th Norfolks, and in uh, the beginning of the 1914-18 war, he was called up and went, most willingly, like most of the young men of that day, only too proud to go, and. Uh, found that they were going to Gallipoli, landing in Gallipoli. And that uh, in the landings in the early August 1915, his company advanced under heavy fire and were heavily overnumbered. Uh, and um, they uh, got as far as a wood, which um, set fire uh, probably from all the firing and one thing and another, and they were uh, most of them shot, including Arthur, who was shot through the head, through its cheekbone, and it came out his jaw. And um, he, of course, after that, wasn't able to do anything else. And he was lying there, and um, it went quiet. 
and the shooting had finished and he realised that the Turks were coming along collecting the dead and the, the wounded seeing and the bayoneting some of the wounded including him and he got a, a nasty bayonet wound in his thigh but and the Turkish soldier was got his bayonet up to plunge it into him again when a German officer stopped him and said that man is not dead and he must be taken prisoner he must have suffered considerably from his wounds and he couldn't communicate with other people and he had a long time before he could let his family know what had happened and uh, I think that when it was all over he was so thankful to come home that he didn't really want to talk about it and also there were so many other people who had come home from even worse experiences in so many ways it affected nearly every man of his age in the country. I think as he got older and uh, he uh, realised there were so few survivors of that war altogether and I think that mm, I had grandsons who were interested to, to hear about it and that sort of thing and I think he talked about it more freely then because he realised how 